Hello, everybody. I'm Justin Benson, uh, Sales VP for SafeNet for the Americas here, and welcome to our webinar on Trialware, uh, talking about selling more software while uh, reducing risk and uh, avoiding complexity. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we'll begin. Hopefully, everybody's seeing slides move forward as I uh, click there. Uh, as we discussed, we'll do a quick background uh, from an agenda perspective, a quick background on SafeNet. We'll discuss what exactly is trialware uh, because it comes in many different flavors, uh, and then talk about the benefits and some of the risks associated with trialware, uh, get into some trialware best practices and methods, and then finish up with some specific examples. I'll talk a little earlier on in the first few slides, and then I'll hand it over to Dale, uh, who will delve in more from a technical perspective. So. Hopefully, we'll cover uh, both areas for you. You can ask questions at any time through your console. We encourage that. Uh, when, I, when Dale is talking, I'll be reviewing the questions, and uh, I'll certainly interrupt him with some good questions rather than just wait till the end. So if you have questions as we're going through, feel free to uh, use the question button and submit those questions for us. So the obligatory uh, background on SafeNet. Uh, for some people, you may know this already, but uh, we are the leader in anti-piracy and IP protection. Uh, we do, as a company combined, around $450 million. Uh, makes us the fourth largest global security company. Uh, we're based on the East Coast, just north of Baltimore, have around about 1,600 employees and have many, many uh, customers. Uh, the division that you're talking to today, the SRM division, uh, does around about $100 million of that $450 million in revenue that we do. And in our division, we break it out sort of into four broad categories. As you can uh, imagine, there's a very diverse market uh, from five-person startup companies to uh, billion-dollar software companies. And, you know, we've got to have solutions that address all elements of that market. We look at it in four big buckets. First of all, is the software licensing, uh, which can be both um, – soft licensing base, which is your traditional software-based licensing, as well as hard key or dongle-based licensing. Uh, we have solutions that address both sides of that market uh, and customers that use both of those even within the same product lines. Our second group is really entitlement management. So once you have licensing, often the devil's in the details in terms of how do you manage that license? What's the customer experience like? Can you recognize revenue through delivering your licenses? Are you integrated to your CRM systems, your ERP systems? And that is that second bucket there for our software license and entitlement management. Uh, the third area uh, for us is a, a new and evolving area. And we're responding to customer requests, and just like I'm sure everybody on this phone, it's a great deal of interest around delivering and protecting software now in, in the cloud, both uh, private and public. And it's a very similar set of challenges, but it also has its own unique uh, requirements. So we're focused in on uh, provisioning, metering, helping uh, developers of SaaS-based applications really be able to, just as, prepare, just as software companies can today, you know, acquire third-party licensing to embed in their technology so they can protect their applications and implement new business uh, models fairly easily. We want to recreate that experience for people developing SaaS-based applications, and that's a big part of our focus there. Uh, lastly, we have a professional services group that uh, ranges the spectrum from, you know, lengthy on-site best practices, uh, consultant engagements, you know, way before you're ready for even looking at products, just helping you map out your terrain and your landscape, all the way through to tactical professional service engineering that help our customers build, uh, you know, integration modules. Uh, if they have homegrown licensing, want to integrate that, things like that. All right, good. So that just gives a quick overview of, of the way we're broken out. So what is trialware? I think we all understand the concept, and we've all, uh, you know, been involved with a 15-day trial or a 30-day trial. You know, trialware is typically free at access to your software, uh, and it's free, but you know, obviously there's some there's some pretty serious constraints around that uh, in most models of trialware. So you can have the traditional fully featured, you know, 30 days try before you buy. Uh, all those, you know, those models are very popular and very common out there. Uh, some of these other models can be a subset of that or could be standalone in themselves. So 
Uh, you might have feature-based control, which is you, uh, I think we've all seen that, where you get access to an application, but some of its features, they might be saving documents, printing documents, things like that are, are disabled and only enabled once you purchase a fully functioning copy and update with the license key. You might have function-based. Uh, rather than feature, you might have function-based. It might be able to do only certain elements. Uh, the application might be able to only do certain elements of its functionality. Um, it might be able to only do one project at a time. Uh, you know, if you're if the value of the software is managing multiple projects, you know, in a diverse back-end environment, then you, know, you get you get to test it, but you're you're not going to be able to use it for extended period of time. User-based, again, in multi-environments, you may only enable 10 users when you know that typically your customer, if they roll it out, will want 100 or 200. So you might, you know, might have an unlimited time-based feature in it, but just uh, enable it to 10 people, knowing that once the folks, you know, get used to it, then that will be a number that won't be particularly helpful for them. And the last version is freemium. You know, free versions uh, that are, you know, a path for you to upsell and get paid versions later on. Moving on to the next slide here. I jumped one there. All right, so the benefits of trialware. There's definitely a concept, um, just move forward one slide, there's definitely a concept in sales of the first to the prospect wins. It's not applicable to every software company, um, but it's applicable to many and more than perhaps most people think, which is that you know competition in the marketplace tends to drive a lot of feature parity. You may implement some features and leapfrog your competitor for a short period of time, but if you've truly done that, they'll catch up to you soon, soon enough, or vice versa. So often, what happens is that you know it's mind share, and the same argument is used why you see uh, software companies seed the educational environment. The sense is that if engineers start using, or developers, or whoever the target end user is start using your application and feel comfortable with it, then it's going to be very hard for them to say, well, why would I evaluate something else? This works just fine. I'll have a look at it. They've already built up comfort with you. So uh, having that trial where if yours is the right type of product, it can be, uh, you know, powerful first to prospects wins. Secondly, and this sounds a little bit strange, but it can be very true, uh, you know, a lot of marketing programs, it can be the call to action for that. So, uh, you know, you develop a marketing program to get attention from prospective buyers, and now what do they do? You know, traditional response is a white paper or, you know, call somebody in sales. This can be another call to action, which is, hey, drive them into the download of your application, get them up and using it in the trialware environment. We talked before about the upsell opportunities, the fully featured versions. I think people understand, you know, the benefit of that. Um, it also can, uh, in some ways, reduce your time to revenue. That is, customers have downloaded the trial where they've used it. By the time they call your sales department or engage, you know, with your organization, they've, they've got the product, they've played with it, they've understand understood the things it does well, and if they've got two or three questions left or objections, then, then then you can now write in on that issue versus if it's a first-time call, you tend to spend a great deal more time just giving background, things like that. Uh, it can also help you test new markets, turn tries into buyers. Uh, another thing it can do, especially in the freemium, from a freemium perspective, is that um, if free users or trial users still typically have the same amount of questions and, and create the same amount of buzz. So, uh, there's definitely an element of critical mass in an in internet world. You know, in the, in the ideal world, you've got 10,000, 20,000 customers of yours out there, you know, writing Twitter comments, writing blog comments, you know, using support forums. If you're a startup company or launching a new product, it's going to take you a while to get there. But if you see the market with freemium versions, you can create a similar buzz. So that if someone goes into Google or goes into Twitter and searches on, you know, I need an application that will help me, you know, I'm an, I'm an auto dealer. Uh, your product may show up there because you've created buzz by having five to 10,000 people talking about it in the freemium model. So it can definitely help you create buzz when you're starting launching as a company or launching a new product. The more hands it's in, the more buzz there is out there, and we know that that tends to have a positive upside for, you know, people that are coming after you searching for that product. All right, next slide. There 
we go, for me at least. Um, some of the risks of trialware, you know, poorly implemented trialware or poorly both from a technical perspective and from a business model perspective can you know, end up creating a, a lack of impetus for your customers to upgrade. The most obvious is time-based, right? So one of the mistakes that we sometimes see is that you do time-based 30 days, and after that it turns into nagware. So what typically happens is that someone who's interested in your product, you don't take it away from them. You're, you're too nervous to take it away from them after 30 days. You don't have the conviction to do that. Yet at the same time, you don't want them to use it forever without some sort of, you know, impediment. So you end up putting some type of nagware in there or you start limiting features. So, that, you know, the downside is that takes a very positive initial experience and just turns it into a negative one. So, you know, our suggestion would be, you know, if, if you feel like 30 days is the right days, uh, right amount of time, stick by that. If you feel like it should be longer, give them longer. But don't sort of position it one way and, and leave it another. You know, that's a kind of a loophole in your, your implementation that ends up uh, customers just get turned off and don't purchase either way. The other thing is that you uh, often are guessing. You know, your, your assumption is, well, let's do a 30-day or let's maybe do a feature-limited uh, uh, version of Trial Let's do a freemium version. Um, one of the problems is if you select that and then you find out within the marketplace the way your end users and prospective customers are using it, it would be much better to give them those features but maybe limit the users or there was, you know, another way to do it. Uh, you, you need to make sure you've got the flexibility so that you can change pretty quickly to adapt to, you know, how it's being trialed in the marketplace. Lastly, implementation, a big part of that, you know, people overlook is they'll, okay, what code will we put in the trial version? You know, what, what will we do in terms of when it requests a license key? That's a big, important part of the user in, uh, experience. But if, you know, customers can't find it, if it's a poor download experience, if they have to fill out a lengthy form with, you know, redundant information, you're not even going to get to that point where they're, where they're concerned about, you know, the UI experience when they're actually in the application. So um, definitely if you decide to go with trialware, make sure you think about the end-to-end -end, uh, experience and, and, you know, what's the customer going to get go from the get-go when they're a prospect first, clicking on a link and arriving at your site. All right. Move forward to the next slide. So this is the slide where I answer my own objections from the previous slide. So um, be flexible. Uh, when you implement a process, make sure that you can change it, as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, have a level of security about it. Uh, often what, what we'll see is that people will have implemented trialware for one particular market, and then they want to expand the new or developing markets. But if they've, uh, you know, been developing up until that point for well-established you know, Western markets where there's a strong respect for, for both IP and fear of repercussion from abusing it, you know, that may not be the case in the new market. So when you're implementing a trial version or trialware, you know, make sure it does have security so that you can enter into all sorts of markets and, and still feel relatively good about not being vulnerable to uh, your application being exploited. And think about that end-to-end -end solution again. You know, it's great if you implement trialware and you protect your software, but if you don't have a positive customer experience, if you don't have a good website, if you don't have, uh, if you can't ship product out or you have a very poor download experience, your support organization isn't prepared, doesn't know how to treat these non-paying folks, then uh, then your investment in the trialware may itself have been uh, a waste or, or at least take a long time before you can make some changes to get that value back. Okay, so at this stage, I'll hand it over to Dale. Dale is an SE on our team. Uh, he's based at Chicago, been with the company for quite a long time right now and deals on a, on a daily basis with you know, many of our customers are looking to implement these challenges. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dale. Yep, thanks, Justin. Yeah, as Justin mentioned, I'll just kind of go through a bit on the technical side. Um, so initially, we'll speak about how trial reinforcement is done. So essentially, uh, regardless of how you look at it, it comes down to one of two ways. Uh, one with the hardware keys, and for those who may not be too familiar, a hardware key is a, a most common terminology is a dongle, and it's just a physical device that must be connected to the USB, a parallel port, PC, MCIA slot. Uh, and essentially, once it's connected, it allows the software to run. 
Uh, but more uniquely in the trial area, uh, in, in some, some of the pros that you have with this, uh, for the physical device, you do have the additional layer of security. A physical device will always, of course, uh, be the, the more secure uh, way to do it. You do have that tangible uh, thing. Uh, some customers like that, you know, the tangibility. They, they can hold something. They can easily identify it. And you do have that portability. Uh, some of the cons, of course, you know, that we hear are, are the costs. You know, so for those customers who don't convert for those non-conversions, what happens to that key? You know, does the, the customer mail it back? Is there some policy to enforce that? Or do you kind of ultimately eat that cost? Uh, then, of course, the physical delivery. Justin had mentioned quick to market. Uh, usually the first to market wins, and with that strategy, you kind of have to do a physical delivery of, of the device in a trial wear. Then, of course, you do always have that, uh, that, you know, that unforeseen instance if it's broken or lost. Uh, and, of course, doing trial wear, that's something you don't want to have to happen. You know, if the key is broken, then the software cannot run during the trial phase, and more than likely that may turn the prospect off from uh, doing the processes. And likewise, on the software key side, uh, again, software key is just really a virtual key that kind of relies on a machine fingerprint, which comes down to usually hardware characteristics, and really it just kind of does a similar thing as a hardware key, just a different mode of doing it. Uh, it enforces and enables the licenses to run. Uh, and the pros on that as well, of course, you can have that ESD, electronic software delivery or distribution, where someone can go to the website and easily download that. Uh, and Justin mentioned that beforehand, you can have that, uh, that kind of user registration model. Uh, of course, you do have the ability to do the Internet activation, and nothing needs to be shipped. Uh, and then, of course, it's less vulnerable to loss. Uh, it's going to be tied down to that physical machine, so unless someone loses their physical machine, you know, you're going to increase uh, that, that with that. And on the cons, of course, you do have, depending on the level of sophistication with the solution, uh, a lower security. Uh, and then, of course, security, that, that's kind of enables sometimes the developer to have to create two different versions of the software, one for a uh, trial version and one for the full version, which, of course, now creates that hassle. Once a customer purchases, they have to do the add-remove programs, uninstall the trial version, reinstall the full version. Uh, and then, again, depending on the level of sophistication of the uh, solution you decide. Uh, then, of course, you do have that high dependency on computer hardware. Uh, you know, one of the nuisances with software key sometimes is if a customer hard drive crash or they change memory in the machine, uh, they're going to have to contact, you know, support uh, of the company to... You know, the software stops running, so they need to have the license renewed or reactivated. So those are some of the pros and cons, uh, just on a very basic high level um, you know, of devices. Hey, Dale, I've got, into, uh, oh. I was going to say, Dale, I've got a question. On, yeah, I've got a of question course. on that one, it's Justin. Um, do any customers use both hardware keys and software keys with the same application, or are they mutually exclusive? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we do have some customers who do do use both. Uh, if they're looking for a heightened security, it's possible to take the software key and kind of use the hardware key as some kind of CID in that kind of uh, instance where they, whereas they want to lock to the physical device. Uh, so it's kind of a way of doing a, a two-factor kind of authentication to make sure you can heighten that level of security. Uh, but it's, it's possible. You can do. It's very simple to do. So just kind of moving on, uh, you know, just uh, describing, you know, the two methods. Uh, so one of our, one of the solutions that allows us to do, we, we mentioned, as Kickstart. Uh, so in this instance, we have customers who would like to use a software license for trial where so you can kickstart the license, whereas they can go online and download, as you see in the top in phase one. Uh, they can download the software and then run through a trial process. And during that trial, uh, we say we're feature-based licensing, so essentially a feature is just a, a module or a functionality, anything you license and control or sell. So you can actually define during a trial uh, process what you want to give the access to. So you can give the access to one module, one feature. You can give the access to everything on that limited time base, of course. And then, of course, you see in Phase 2, once a customer has purchased, you'll, you'll simply mail to them that hardware dongle. Uh, once they receive the dongle, there's no new software needed to be installed. They can just plug in the dongle, and now the licenses that will uh, be accessed will be, of course, what they paid for. So in this instance, they have a trial where that maybe has uh, one of the three functionalities available, and once they purchase, you ship them that, uh, the dongle, and of course, once they retrieve it, they essentially unlock the full license just by inserting the dongle. Okay, and then likewise, in, in the same kind of instance, so using, again, the Kickstarter license where the customer went to download and they have that 30-day, uh, 15-day, X number of days uh, that you've allocated to do the trial process to test the application. Uh, once the customer is satisfied, 
Uh, essentially, you, you mail to them the hardware key, so the very similar uh, Internet activation process, as we mentioned. So you have the avail availability to do the Internet activation. There's no new software that needs to be uh, shipped or installed on a customer's end. And again, the, what's going to be unlocked, um, the full license potentially, but again, uh, anything that the customer purchases. So you can pretty much say, okay, I'm going to license X number of features, and this is I'm going to give the access to what came in on the PO, what the customer purchases, what they get. And, of course, the benefit is you can always upgrade, downgrade without having to ship new software. And here's just a bit of the, again, you know, just the trial rate in action, uh, both models again. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side, you have your application that runs in a demo mode. Again, we just allocated one of the most common uh, usage period, which normally is about 30 days. Uh, so once the customer is using the application for the X number of days and they can do it before, during, or even after that time is expired. Uh, they can upgrade to the full version, uh, of course, with any kind of uh, key that you sell. If it's a software key, again, you, you distribute that product key, the serial key, so they can do the activation. Or you mail them that hardware key. Um, and again, our keys, they're independent of the licenses, so you can have, you can, uh, you know, allow any kind of license type. And it just really allows you to adapt to your market, adapt to your customers. And the licenses, again, as we mentioned, we're feature-based. That just really means that each different feature can be, excuse me, it can be licensed independently. So if I have what, two modules, I can license one module on a perpetual, a pretty much unlimited base, and a second module can be subscription within the same application. They're not bound to each other, so you do have that flexibility to, uh, to kind of mix and match the licenses and just meet needs on the fly. So kind of just taking a step back um, and just showing like a high-level picture of the solution for those who may not be too familiar with our solutions. Uh, essentially what we've done to make it very easy, we've just simply separated the engineering from the business process. So we allow your engineering resources to protect the application, and once they're done, they now produce this one single binary. Um, and they're pretty much out of the equation until the next build. Um, so now with this application, you can have your product management or the business team to define the license models and, of course, define the, the different keys they want to set, if it's a hardware key or the software key. And now the benefit of this is anytime you need to alter a license type, whether it's upgrade or you need to extend licenses, uh, you don't have to call the engineering back, the engineering resources back into the equation to create a new build. The license itself is bound inside the key securely. It's not inside the application, so it just makes it easier to manage. And then again on the solution side, uh, we do offer uh, the solution gives you the ability to centrally manage your licenses. Uh, so the interface is role-based, of course. Uh, there's a central data repository. Uh, so again, with the role base, you can see here different roles have the different access uh, in the database to different pieces of information. Uh, Justin had mentioned as well, opposed to using uh, you know, the front-end GUI, you can integrate with such things like the ERP system, business intelligence, uh, CRM, and so forth. So you do have that, that access to do, but we do offer that, uh, the central data repository just to keep you uh, to kind of creating data silos so you don't have to go to different machines or different terminals to get certain different information. But it is role-based, um, and this is included in our solution. Uh, this makes it much easier to look up products, so as product management will go and create the license configurations. Customer service would be kind of tasked with uh, activating, and, or activating and fulfilling orders and things like that. And then again, you can you know feel free to ask any kind of questions, and I'll pass it back to Justin here so we can just kind of go through a case that one of the customers who had integrated with us. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, I just uh, reiterate that we're, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them. Um, this is an example from Hilton Systems Engineering, and I think that this is, you know, um, a good example. Really, kind of sums up a lot of things that we've talked about right now. And so, you know, like many uh, of our customers and/or prospective customers, you, you know, there's these conflicting goals, which is we, you know, we want to protect our software from piracy and reverse engineering, you know, but on the flip side, we want to get it into as many people's hands as possible uh, and have flexible new ways to sell it. So uh, Tilton, as I mentioned, uh, an existing customer of ours, uh, they ultimately went with uh, both the HASP HL you know, and SL uh, licensing solution, which, uh, you know, in normal language means they're using both the hard keys and dongles as well as soft licenses. Uh, as I mentioned before, we'll see that soft licensing usually for, for the U.S. and then 
perhaps in the developing company, uh, countries, they'll go with uh, hard license keys or dongles uh, for, you know, a high level of protection. So Tilton is a you know, good example and, uh, you know, many other customers in, in a similar boat to this. All right, next slide. So, just like we mentioned, um, here's a product, here's a product pitch, uh, and you can do a download uh, and trial our application uh, from a trialware perspective. Uh, so, for folks that are interested, it's a fairly straightforward URL, SafeNet Dash Inc. forward, uh, forward slash trialware. Uh, and if you, you, you like what you hear today and you like to learn, uh, you know, uh, see some more, experiment some more, feel free to download from there. Next slide. All right, so Q&A. Uh, if anyone's having any troubles technically uh, submitting the Q&A, let us know, but hopefully you'll find the questions button. You can submit it. If you have any questions on anything you've seen here today, uh, we're happy to take those. I'll give people a minute or two to put those up. Uh, but again, we look for your questions. And um, while we're doing that, here's just some more information. Uh, for folks that are interested in following us, we have you know, the obligatory, again, licensing live blog, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, there's some pretty active discussions on, on LinkedIn for us and the blog as well. So if you're interested in tracking us and following, uh, following along further, feel free to do it at these locations. All right, so let me go to the questions tabs. Let me see what we have here. All right. Let me have a look. Oh, so we have one question, Dale. Do people... Um, do people uh, – sorry, just the three or four questions popped up all at once, so it, uh, it threw me off there. Can you do blended models? Can you do uh, – like a, I think that I'm, I'm going to uh, paraphrase the question. Can you do feature-based licensing, you know, plus user-based in a 30-day trial environment or a 15-day trial environment? Or is this exclusive that you typically people only do one of those? Um, yes, yeah, so this is Dale. No, that's possible to do. Uh, most customers, just for the ease of use, um, you know, since they may have the ability to download online, they may not have the customer information beforehand, they do that. But that is certainly possible. Um, you do have the ability to kind of define that trial. You can even drill down to say you can use the application one time or something like that, or X number of uses. Um, so you can define that. Um, that would just require, of course, you would recognize that customer name sometime beforehand, whether it's before the installation, during the installation. Um, but that's possible to kind of limit it by customer um, name as well. Sure. Okay. So someone gave us a question, can you describe SAS? Uh, could you give me a little more in the way of detail what you're looking for? I mean, SAS, what SAS means in the big picture or, or, or what it means for us? So I had that question there, but I'm not sure how I answer it. Another one I have, though, while uh, maybe we update that, is um, a question around a low-profile dongle. Uh, this may be an existing customer. They say they know about software keys, but they like dongles. Um, however, they've had keys break before. They're wondering from a physical uh, device perspective, what are our futures? What are our future goals around that? Can you speak to that, Tim? Yeah, we can kind of touch upon that. I know there's some unique things going on with product management. Uh, right now, we do have some sort of low-end dongle that doesn't pretty much contain any kind of memory, so it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's pretty much plug-and-play. Um, if there's something needed lower than that, you would need the exact, uh, you know, exactly what you're looking for. As long as it's kind of Bluetooth protocol, I don't recall anything offhand, but, you know, if you want to leave, um, you know, further information, we can just double-check with product management to see, you know, kind of what's going on, and we can always update you. Okay, good. So, another question here: Can you can we enforce customer registration with your trialware solution? So, I and I think what the the question means by that is, would you, would you you'd like to capture from a lead generation sales perspective? You'd like to capture the information before the person uh, then goes ahead and does trialware. 
I think the short answer is yes on that. I think the devil's a little bit in the details. Um, if you'd like a sophisticated customer, well, I mean, it's not overly sophisticated, but certainly one approach is to have a traditional web form that customers fill out. Uh, once they've filled that out, we would create an entitlement for them that allowed them to download the trialware. Uh, there might be multiple options there, so we could, you know, slice and dice that. Um, that's typically, you know, when we, it, that's definitely something you can do with us. Uh, before I talked about EMS or our entitlement management solution, uh, depending on, you know, it, we may need that depending on the level of sophistication. So we want, want you to have that along with the trialware code that would be in your application to kind of have a complete end-to-end -end solution. That's on the high end of the spectrum. There are simpler ways to do it too, depending on your size and your need. Dale, anything you'd answer, you, you'd add to that answer? Yeah, I mean, just again, you do um, have the ability to kind of enforce registration. And, of course, being a software vendor, you can decide when you want to do that. Um, we do have some customers that kind of enforce it during the install, after the install, or even during the activation, or even sometimes after activation. So, yeah, you do have the ability to kind of, you know, retrieve that information. Um, and if, it, you know, you use the registration, it's possible. Um, you can send it directly to the same database. Or you can kind of enforce that from your own CRM system. Some customers also do that before the download, you know. So you, um, you do have the option to do that, but you will just kind of think about what's best, you know, when would be the best time to retrieve the information from the, uh, the prospect. Very good. Uh, the SAS question, uh, the question is, and thank you for adding more detail. Does that mean you can enable us to offer our software via the web on a pay-per-use basis? Again, I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, that's the idea. That's the goal that we're driving towards. Um, there, now, there's obviously several elements to having a SaaS-based ready application. Uh, there's the infrastructure. There's the ability to, you know, capture payment. There's the ability to, you know, take your application and offer it uh, in a sophisticated way so that users can buy only certain features or have enterprise-level, beginner-level. So there's a lot in there. And we uh, we do not do everything that I just mentioned. Uh, nobody does. Um, so I want to just uh, you know put that per, that clarification around that. But um, we definitely do do that. And on our website, uh, we have a series of SaaS-based uh, webcasts that we've been doing that are available through Bright Talk. Um, so you could call. I think it's called Navigating the Cloud. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, you know, and, and not ready to talk to somebody. If you're an existing customer, certainly chat. We have an active program going on. If you'd like to do some more research, um, it's on this same channel, Right Talk Licensing Live channel, uh, Navigating the Cloud. Okay, somebody came uh, late and is interested in getting a copy of the presentation. Uh, if you, and it says you're a current customer, if you know who you're, salesperson is, um, certainly you'll be able to get it through that. If you follow us on uh, Twitter, we'll post it there for you in terms of a link to be able to get it. And, uh, and naturally, it, it also shows up in a replay. Um, uh, it's about five minutes after we wrap this up. I think we have it same link that you had before, so you should be able to get a copy either way. I've got a, another follow-up question on uh, size of the dongle. And I think for, as Dale touched upon before, we've got some interesting things coming uh, with that. So if you're you know, interested in specifics, you know, very specific specs and sizes, uh, again, if you're a current customer, uh, feel free to uh, work with your salesperson if you don't have anybody yet. Um, I think there'll be an email uh, at the end that we post here. If you want to contact me, uh, I can make sure we get you more specific answers on on what we have coming down in terms of uh, future uh, physical devices. Oh, all right. All right, here's one for you, Dale. Any differences between trial solutions for network licenses versus PC licenses? Well, in the instance of trial, if you're doing uh, network licenses, um, there will be some kind of difference in the network versus uh, just PC node lock. Um, so, of course, a PC node lock would just simply lock on this one machine and allow just a local user. Uh, if you have some kind of a network license, then, of course, you have one machine that's going to serve as a, uh, a licensed host or a licensed server, and that will administer to X number of users. 
And of course, as a vendor, you can specify the X number of users. Many many users many vendors do that, and of course, sell those additional seats. Uh, but as far as uh, the functionality, uh, the same kind of functionality, uh, it's just a kind of remote access. You know, but on the vendor side, it's a, a, a little difference in the license configuration that you would alter. All right. Good. Um, another question: We have uh, used hotkeys in the past for software from on a month-to-month -month rental basis. Could we use this, Could we do that with soft keys as well, or will, does it require a key hard key? Yeah, so very similar. So yes, yeah, so you can take advantage of the software license, and you can and you can kind of implement that same model. The 30 days, uh, you can either do X number of days licenses, or you can have it hard expire on the end of the month every month. And then once a customer upgrades or pays, of course, you would send a new uh, monthly update. Uh, you can even go so far as to automate that entire process from the payment to the delivery of the license. But yeah, you can take advantage of the software license key um, to, to carry on that same model that you have today. Okay, good. Do we do we support Mac and Linux? That's an easy one for yep, you. So Mac, uh, yep, so uh, we support Mac and Linux. Uh, Linux, we fully cross-platform with the hardware keys, and early next year we'll have a software license, a secure solution for software license with the Linux platform. And then Mac right now, uh, we're supporting Mac as well, with both the hardware keys and the software keys, uh, so that's possible to, you know, to for, uh, full enforce license on those platforms. All right, good. Uh, there's a question. There's been there's research out there as to when people want trialware in terms of sales cycles. Have you done any of your own research as to why people want trialware and what happens if they don't get it? You know, it's a great question, and I think that there's um, I I so I think it's, you know we have not gone out there and done specific research as as you ask there. I think we certainly uh, the way we typically gather our data is from existing customers who have implemented, and we talk to them about what's working, what isn't. Um, the challenge is that that there's a lot involved in that question, and it's different by um, vertical and by price point and by market type. Um, and so you know, I mean, the short answer is there's definitely examples of you know, competitive, uh, competitive companies where one company owns trialware and, and the other, other doesn't. And, and I don't know when you joined, but we talked earlier about, you know, f you know, first in the cu first in the customer's hands wins. There's definitely examples of that where, uh, it, where that really is a competitive differentiator and that's what drives another company to, um, close the gap and, and offer trialware. I can remember a specific example where a company had a product that sold for around about, I think, $1,500 per seat per year, and they were losing, you know, losing customers regularly to uh, open source to an open source application. At first, they dismissed it because they said we can't compete on price, and you know they're free and we're $1,500, and so we're just, we, we can't compete with that. Uh, then they did some deeper research and found out that the reason that customers were going with the open source versus their solution wasn't really price-based. It was that the open source solution was easy to get access to, uh, and they had a fairly strict uh, qualifying process before they would hand out their trialware. So many times their customers did, this is what happened, they'd be in their pipeline and they'd call up interested in it, they'd become a lead. Uh, and then they would slowly lose interest now they were using the open source application and just didn't see the need anymore to further pursue. So, uh, so, there, so for us, I think we see, you know, examples like that. IDC Gartner has done more specific studies. And, and again, that's not always the case. Sometimes if you have a complex application, uh, or, or an application where really the beauty is in the richness of it and that it needs, you know, professional services or training to, before people can really get the maximum value. That may not suit the trialware uh, model at all. So we certainly don't pretend this is for everybody. But um, uh, there, are, there are, you know, the biggest issue tends to be if if your product uh, is something that people can, you know, get self-started on, and you're not allowing them to do that. You could have great reasons for it, but you have to be aware if your competitors are doing what's the, what, you know, what's the experience for you in the marketplace. Okay, and then there's. Uh, Right now, the final question, unless any more come in, are you happy to make resources available to people like me? 
who would be advising our customers on the available solutions. Um, I think that sounds like somebody in a consulting role, and uh, we're definitely help. Um, we're, we're happy to work with consultants. Um, the one thing we do, though, is it's very difficult if we get kind of um, – sometimes what you get is you get requests that are clouded because someone doesn't want to share data with you. It's very difficult to give them their full precise answers. So, you know, we're open to it. We think they have a very valuable role, and, and as long as you're – you know, confident in talking with us, discussing what they're trying to get done, then there shouldn't be any reason why we wouldn't be. All right. There is, well, for someone I think before, there's a, uh, I just got to note, there is a low-profile dongle that's sturdy, and there's also PM, PCM, CIA form factor dongles for a zero-profile that won't break. Uh, so thanks for that, someone who uh, actually submitted that as a question, someone on, the team that's listening in, because the author was, uh, so hopefully that helps the individual before that was curious about some of the dongle sizes. But, again, feel free to uh, follow up with us if you'd like to learn more. All right, so I have come to the end of the questions. I'll give another 30 seconds or so. Uh, if anyone out there has a question they want to ask or uh, has a follow-up question, speak now. Otherwise, uh, I think we're certainly coming into the formal presentation, and uh, we've got some very good questions. I thought that was a good set of questions. Hopefully, you guys thought they were valuable as well. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, there's the locations that you can follow us. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about us, you can download, um, download a trial version of our trial version from uh, safenet-inc forward slash trialware. Uh, now that you're part of the Bright Talk world, you can access this webinar in an on-demand mode in the future if you'd like to revisit it. And we have other webinar, uh, webinars up there as well, for example, on our current SAS initiative. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Thanks, Dale, for your support and your help today. It's not a problem. I just like seeing how long it takes you to reach for that mute button. Um, all right. So then, if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to uh, learn more, you know those locations. Uh, if you have any additional questions that you submit, probably follow up an email. I just got one or two there, but I feel like we have wrapped things up. Um, and then uh, again, Justin Benson on my side overseeing sales, and Dale who's an SE for us. Uh, you can certainly follow up with us. I'd rather we don't publish our emails because we end up on spaminators. But uh, if you're out there, um, you can just do first name, period, last name uh, for either of us. If you like to re yeah, like to get in hold of uh, contact with us. All right. Thanks very much, uh, everybody, and uh, and we appreciate your attending. Thanks a lot. Thank you.